the author of Hebrews took on a challenge of explaining to his audience, the first century Jews, who Jesus was and why they should have faith in him. And we're not first century Jews, but the council that put together all the letters of the New Testament said this book is particularly helpful to Jews and non-Jews alike. Whether it's the first century or the third or the 21st, we get a picture of Jesus in this book that's helpful for all of us. And so we look into this book as a way to understand and discover even more who Jesus is. And the last three sermons we had, we looked at just a lot of descriptions of Jesus. Who is the Son of God? That was a pretty radical idea at that time, and we got a lot of ideas the last few weeks about who Jesus is and why it should make a matter in our faith. There were warnings not to fall away from our faith or to have a hardened, unbelieving, disobedient heart. And because Jesus is real, even though he's in heaven, what he's done for us continues on today and it makes a difference in our faith. We talked about we worship Jesus as king. We know Jesus as our brother. We trust Jesus as our priest. They kind of introduced that idea, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more today. We're told we need to invite Jesus into our lives like a home that he can dwell in. We're told we need to exhort one another. We need to encourage each other to do the good works of the Lord. And we need to absorb the word of God. Those are the things that we've been looking at. And chapters 4 through 8 is one big section and if we were to break this down into lots of little sections, it would take us weeks and weeks to get through. So I'm just going to give it an overview. And I hope you can go home and maybe this week open up your Bible and read all of verses, all of chapters 4 through 8. We're just going to hit a few, few parts of it here today. There wasn't room to put it all in the bulletin. It will be on the screen and at least the, the bulletin tells us which passages we're looking at. Um, Anyway, we are going to dig deep in what it means as Jesus is our priest. And this is going to connect with the next two Sunday sermons. They actually all go together. Actually, this should all be one big sermon talking about Jesus as our priest. Then we're going to get into Jesus as our sacrifice. And then Jesus as our temple. And when we talk about priest and sacrifice and temples, those are things that are very foreign to us. And the reason they're foreign to us is because we no longer need those things anymore because all of those things that were a part of the faith of the Jews before were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so we no longer need to have priests and sacrifices and the temple in order to be able to worship God. So all these things are going to fit together. And even though, like I said, even though it deals with first century Jews, hopefully we can learn and appreciate our faith and see how the old faith ties together with the new covenant that was given to us. So we can learn a lot and be able to see Jesus for who he is. So next week we'll get into the topics of sacrifices and, and priests. So we got those coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully we can put all three of these together and I'll review each week so to make sure we can see how they all fit together. Um, so the, the Jew in the first century, they hear about Jesus dying on the cross, okay? To provide salvation. And many of them had faith. They believed that it was true. But then they said, well, what do we do about the temple? What do we do about the priests? What do we do about the sacrifices? And so the author of Hebrews, and we don't know who the author is, but it was one of the apostles, the early church leaders, is explaining to them that Jesus fulfilled the temple and the priest and the sacrifice roles. And we no longer need to have those because they were offered in Jesus so you can imagine this new paradigm to people who were faithful. I mean, going to the temple was a big deal. Offering their sacrifices was a big deal. You know, going to the priest to offer those sacrifices, those were big deals. Those were so central to their faith. Because without the sacrifice, there was no forgiveness of their sins. Without a priest to offer the sacrifice, there would be no way to get that sacrifice to the Lord. Because only the priest could enter into the secret place of the temple to offer those things up. And without the temple to put it in, or at least a tabernacle that kind of would work as a temporary temple at times when it wasn't built, there was no place for God to be. Do you remember that the Ark of the Covenant was a box where Jesus, where God said, I'm going to dwell in that box and I'm going to dwell on earth among you in that temple. 
And so there was a place where God was here on earth in that temple. And so these things are so central to the faith of these people. And all of a sudden they're told, you no longer need this anymore. Because God dwells where? He dwells in our hearts. And Jesus was the sacrifice. And Jesus is our priest. And our bodies are the temple of the Lord. And so this was a radically new concept for these people. You can imagine how hard it would be to change the paradigm that they were going through at this time. There was a Swiss um, watchmaker um, who came up with the idea of digital timekeeping. Because, you know, the Swiss, that was their thing, right? Clocks. And the leaders of all companies said, nobody wants that. So he sold it to the Japanese. Who's the leading people today making clocks, right? You know, the new paradigm scares people. New, 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 new paradigms are hard because all of a sudden things are different than they were before. We did it one way, now we've got to do it a new way. And change is hard. And it's hard for us today. But for these people, this was a very radical paradigm shift that they had in being able to deal with the topics of temples and sacrifices and priests. If you ever want encouragement that Jesus is real and he's near to you and he cares about you, these, these chapters of Hebrews will help us so much in that. The verses we just read earlier remind us that we have this great, this great high priest who understands us. He knows us very, very, very intimately. So we're going to look at a few passages today, make a few comments on them as we think about Jesus as a high priest and what it means in our lives. In chapter 4, 14 to 16, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us do what? Hold fast our confession. Okay, just because he went away doesn't mean our confession of faith goes away, right? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus, our priest, he does what? He sympathizes with us. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our temptations. The only difference is Jesus never gave in to those weaknesses and temptations. But he knows what it's like to be hammered with them. He knows what it's like to get those bullets coming his way. And he was able to hold them off through faith and obedience. And he's asking us to do the same. You know, why do we have support groups? Because we need people to understand us. We need to go have people we can talk to about things that will give us great comfort. Because when we feel alone, it's a very scary thing. It's a very vulnerable thing. And sometimes we feel alone in our weaknesses and temptations, don't we? We think, gosh, I'm the only one. What's wrong with me? Why do these thoughts enter my head? Why am I so drawn to this? Why did I say that again? Why did I do that again? You know, we beat ourselves up, don't we? With guilt and shame and blame, you know? But we're not alone because we all suffer the same way in that. Every temptation that we have, we all understand each other's. And some people may deal more with one temptation than another. And there's no big list of Jesus, of God, that this, this is the worst sin and that's the least. I mean, it's hard. It's, just, it's all hard. But we have Jesus who understands our weaknesses. He sympathizes with us. And we know that we don't have to feel alone because Jesus understands. And when it says that we can, we can draw to his throne of grace with what? Confidence. It's a throne of grace, not of judgment. He's not up there zapping us with lightning bolts every time we do that again, every time we say that again. You know, he's up there giving us grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. And when we feel those temptations and weaknesses coming on, if we remember this, what can we do? Instead of running to the temptation or falling to the weakness, we go to Jesus. We say, Jesus, you're on the throne. Help me. Help me be strong. Help me say no. Help me do the right thing. And he's given us that grace and mercy to do it. He's promised to do that. We go on to the next passage here we look at. Hebrews 5, 1 to 3. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. 
He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward because since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. Just as a Jew could approach the priest and say, I'm offering you the sacrifice for my sins, could you take it to the altar and offer it up? The priest was able to accept it in a very gentle way because he knows himself he's a sinner. And before the priest could offer up the sacrifice for somebody else, he'd have to confess his own sins because he himself is just as guilty as the person who's asking him to stand in his place. Now, the, the priest would go into the temple and there was always the risk that if that priest had not, had not covered his own sins, then he could be struck dead right there. You know, I mean, he could not approach the Lord in that temple with that sacrifice unless he himself is holy and pure and clean. So he had to offer up the sacrifices for himself before he could ask, offer up the sacrifices for all the people who depended on him. That priest was a very important person in these people's lives. They wanted to make sure that priest was right before God, before they, he could offer up their sacrifices as well. You know, Jesus never sinned, but when he stood there on that cross for us, he took our sin. He stood there on that cross, hung there on that cross as a sinner, taking our guilt, our blame, our shame. And it was a sacrifice. This gets into the next thing, talking about him being a sacrifice. He was the priest who offered up himself as a sacrifice. The irony of it. He did it all. And he was accepted before God. His sacrifice was perfect. And so therefore, we have a priest, Jesus, who is already able to stand before the Lord and offer up what we need. And so we don't need a mediator. We don't have to have a person on earth to talk to God to say, Will you give this person forgiveness. Because we go directly to Jesus. He is our mediator. He is the one, is our priest that stands before us. You know, confession of our sins to the Lord is a very important part of our faith. You know, it's okay to say, God, I messed up again. I'm sorry. You know, help me. Help me next time I'm in that situation to find that grace and mercy. So that I can not keep stepping back into the same old thing again. It may take months, it may take years. God will work on us in his own way. You know, we are told later on that we are a kingdom of priests. It's like even though Jesus is the high priest, he makes us priests. You know, we can go and stand before God clean and pure because of what Jesus has done for us. And we can, we can, be, we can be priests for one another. We can stand in other places. We know other people are suffering and struggling. We can go to the Lord in prayer and pray for those people. Not just about their health, but about their souls. And we can stand before the Lord and on behalf of everyone else. We need to be able to confess our sins to one another. The book of James tells us that's such a healthy thing to do. Not so that we would have judgment and gossip, but that we can encourage each other. And we can do that. And we can stand before the Lord and pray, knowing that he hears our prayers. That's a great thing that we have there. Next passage here, chapter 6, 17 to 20. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Next. Um. Oop. Did I? Did I leave off the screen here? Um, what's the next one? Here? Sorry. That's the same. And what's this one? That's the next. Go to the next one there. Okay. Now go back. Okay. I left off a couple things, so I'll read the rest of it here. Sorry about that. Left on the screen there. Okay, so it said, by these, it's impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place beyond the curtain, where Jesus is gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever. 
and I'm sorry you didn't get to see it up there, but the, we have that hope. You know, Jesus isn't going to lie. God's not going to lie to us. He gives us a hope that's like an anchor. What does an anchor do? It steadies the ship. It keeps it from moving. Even though the wind blows or the waves come along, that ship stays right there. And this hope is our anchor that helps us stay strong in our faith. All these warnings about falling away and having a hardened heart and, and giving up on the Lord. We don't have to because we have an anchor. We can believe that this message is very true. We have total access to God. When the temple, when, when, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, that inner place of the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was had a curtain around it. And that curtain cut in two from the top to the bottom. God just made that curtain rip in two as a way to be able to show that Jesus has died. He's the perfect sacrifice. We have access to God through him. And so that curtain, is a, that, curtain that ripped is a reminder that we have total access to him. And that is an anchor for our souls. And the last passage here we're looking at, or next to last, I'm sorry. In Hebrews 7, it says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. He's holy, he's innocent, he's unstained, he's separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priest, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Jesus had no sin to atone for, but he became the atonement for sinners. Not just any man could have been the sacrifice up there on the cross, but only the Son of God, who was perfect, innocent. Go back to the other, what it say there? He's, you know, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted in the heavens. Only that kind of sacrifice could work for us. And so that's the kind of priest that we have. And he becomes that eternal priest. He stands in our place forever and ever. In the next couple of weeks, as we get into the temple and the sacrifice, all this stuff will fit together. It all ties together. But Jesus is our priest. In chapter 8, verse 6, he says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it's enacted on better promises. The old covenant of bringing the sacrifice to the priest of the temple. That was good. It worked. But there's a better way now. And that's Christ Jesus. That's who we have. And as I was thinking, I'm like, okay, well, what's the, what's the punchline? What's the conclusion? What do we, how do we take this and make it a part of our lives? And I'm like, I don't know. And I kept praying all week, God, what's the, how do I conclude this? I'm not sure. Maybe there's something in your own mind that spirit has already tugged on your heart today in understanding this. Maybe this makes a difference in your life because if you have Jesus as a high priest, maybe, maybe it will help you be more confident to approach him, as the verse said. Maybe the punchline is that you're going to, to take your salvation more seriously. Maybe the, the punchline is that you know somebody else that needs a priest like this and we're gonna pray and work in their lives. I'd like to just take a minute of just silence, just pray and just thank God for him being your priest. And how can you take that into your daily life? Just a minute of silence. We don't need music or anything. It's a moment of silence. And after we do that, we're going to stand and sing.